All right, buddy. I believe we are on the old YouTube. What's up, man? How's it going? Good. How are you? I'm doing on? good. I'm enjoying my Saturday, and we are ready to rock and roll. And we have a pretty fun, fun episode in the can today. We are sort of, this is launching a new special edition series for us, yeah. a special case study that we plan to take all for the, the next year, probably to get through uh, yep. but it's all about rehabbing a, a brand new purchase that we've made and so we'd love you to like share a little more detail on that and kind of kick kick it off yeah 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 so um well it's it's kind of interesting timing what kind of how it came together we uh we've had a couple clients recently who are working through product strategies and uh consults that we've done where people are trying to figure out how to come up with a product um, you know, and, and then as it happens, we got the opportunity to buy a, a Shopify site and it has a collection of social media accounts, uh, connected to it and it needs basically a product rehab. And so we kind of figured, why don't we buy this thing? Why don't we use it as a teaching opportunity and show everybody exactly what we're doing? We'll do a little Pat Flynn open profit and loss statement deal out there in the universe and let people check out what we're doing, how we're going to go about monetizing and taking this Shopify site and the associated social accounts and um, making a cohesive uh, brand out of it. And so that's what we figured we'd do. So we're going to kick it all off. We're going to show you everything we bought and um, we're going to kind of go through where we're at with it. We just literally have completed all the transactional stuff and we're, um, we're excited to start to build it ourselves and, and then uh, teach people along the way. And uh, so anyway, so yeah, so that's that's kind of what we're doing and uh, it should be really fun. So yeah, this is, I think this is going to be a really, really fun exercise and you, you, everyone's going to see everything. You're going to see the, the wins, yeah. the failures. The, <laughs> I mean, because I mean, inevitably, whatever you do, whenever you're launching anything new or you're you know, launching into something, you're going to have like moments of just you can fall on your face because if, if you don't yeah. fall on your face you're not trying hard enough so we i fully expect there's going to be moments of that and then you're going to get a chance to see that here on on youtube as we and right. facebook and however wherever else you're consuming this and it's just going to be it's it's reality it's life in yeah. the trenches and that's kind of what we right. wanted to bring to everybody is yeah. showing them what reality looks like so yeah, it's going to be a, a really good time i think yeah. Um, and it also give us an opportunity to sort of teach some content that we haven't really, uh, you know, kind of dove into adequately, um, except for in our university class um, and with our one on one consulting clients. So we have content that we've taught on at the university level that we've never shared um, to, uh, to sort of our, you know, our fans, followers, audience. Um, and so we thought we would uh, take this opportunity to go through that. It really gives us, a, this is a, like a little case study where we can go through uh, in detail strategy related to product selection. I guess you could call it a um, you know, product uh, um, discovery and brainstorming and selection process for Shopify sites. And uh, this will be a, a good case study to do that. So yeah, yeah. Cool, man. Okay, so let's, uh, let's dive into it. Let's, um, Let's reveal kind of the what we sure. bought, and yes. um, we'll go through that. So hopefully that's like cool Christmas. everybody. Un <laughs> uh, sorry, uh -oh. sorry, pausing my double microphone there. Um, yeah, so uh, let's let's do it. So so here's uh, the website we bought. I'll share my screen and sort of walk through it, and and we'll just explain the details of why we bought what we bought and what it is and um, the associated account. So let me go through screen share here and um, kind of uh, walk through it. So the Shopify site is called Home and Garden America. And uh, so Shopify site with uh, products. And um, so this is the site. And of note on this site is the, uh, the number of blog articles. I think it's something I should have looked before we started this live, but I think it's about 150 blog articles, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, so there's quite a robust uh, collection of blog articles. Uh, but in terms of traffic to the site or any kind of real momentum, sales velocity, anything like that, uh, it's a, you know, a total non-starter. And so 
but but nonetheless, it's a Shopify account. And um, so that's kind of the first piece. And then there's a associated social media accounts that are under a bunch of different names. And so that'll be something that we should talk through sort of our first conversation, but, but there's a Pinterest account. It's got 6,000 followers, um, 19,500, uh, monthly viewers. And, uh, so that's not nothing. Uh, 6,000 uh, Pinterest followers is cool. Right. Yeah. Um, sure. and, uh, so obviously you can see, so it's all gardening related. And, and, uh, then there's a, a YouTube, uh, channel, 53 subscribers. And um, so not nothing. Again, it's a different channel name. So you'll start to see here that there's a little bit of brand randomness. Uh, and then really what you might call the crown jewel of the deal, which is an Instagram account with 162,000 followers um, and the happy gardening life. And uh, this account is um, obviously what attracted us to this, this uh, deal in many ways. Um, so that's something that's, uh, of, uh, you know, an asset that, you know, is not easily, this is not easily redone. This is a real account with real engagement, um, real long-term slow growth over time. You can look at tools to an analyze whether an Instagram account is fake and just built out of bots or not. And this one is not. So, you know, so that's sort of interesting. Um, and then there's a Twitter account, um, with uh, 3,800 followers. And uh, then a Facebook page with 28, oh, sorry, there's Kyle. A uh, Facebook page with 28,000 followers. Um, and so, so this is what we got. Um, and it's a, sort of a collection that um, is ready to be worked on, right? Um, Anything I'm forgetting? Oh, uh, a Facebook uh, Manny chat list of 638 people, something like that. So, yeah. So that's what we've purchased. Mm -hmm. And uh, now it's on us to figure out how to sort it out. Um, I was thinking it might be cool, Kyle, I didn't mention this to you, but to just show our e-commerce engine flywheel as something yeah. that we, yeah. So, so basically, you know, some of the top of my questions are like, well, how do you start? What do we do with this? Yeah. Um, and so Kyle and I consult and coach and teach people on e-commerce stuff every week. We have a, a bunch of clients we work with. And so one of the things that we use as a teaching tool with that uh, group is what we call our e-commerce engine. Um, and so I'll share that um, a little PDF version of that. So you can see this sort of topically. Um, and so, you know, this is sort of what we call our, you know, our e-commerce flywheel. and so basically, you know, top right uh, corner is where you start with goals and then branding. And so, so just think visually of applying this idea to what we just looked at, the Shopify site and what's on it and the other social media channels. So, you know, the goals are there um, to, to talk through. And then the branding is work to be done. And uh, then product strategy needs to be completely redone. Um, and I, as you can tell, sorry, just to back up one step, the branding is sort of all over the place. And so one of the first things we'll look at is um, how do we create a cohesive brand? And uh, that, that would be first before we work on product strategy. Um, and so, you know, we can talk through that. Um, and then following that is pricing and then presentation. And by that, we mean um, basically photography, videography, graphic art. Um, you know, those elements of presentation. And a lot of times that, um, you know, plays out in social media, but it also plays out on your website kind of thing. And then placement, of course, is, uh, or maybe not, of course, but placement is in our vernacular, uh, sales channels. So Shopify is a sales channel, Amazon, eBay, you know, offer up Poshmark, Jet, Walmart, on and on and on. Right? There's a bunch. <laughs> um, and then promotion would fall, um, everything in social media would fall into promotion mm -hmm. and everything in paid advertising strategies would fall under promotion and everything in things like, you know, blogging, SEO, promotion is a massive bucket. And, and most of our coaching clients that come to us, they're focused on how do they get traffic to their Shopify site? Yeah. 
So this is the topic we, we, we sort of always get people asking about, but frequently what we do is point to the right hand side of the flywheel and say, you know, you're not really ready for promotional tactics yet until you have a product figured out or a brand, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, and then growth is really about team structure and that kind of thing. Um, so this is the flywheel. What am I uh, forgetting about that? Any thoughts on how we adapt the flywheel and how we can apply it to this case study? Yeah, I think it. This is this is all of the required components in order to see your e-commerce projects, businesses grow and scale. I mean, yeah, you can't have, and they all sort of fit together in this flywheel the way that they are ordered on purpose with thought behind it because you can't really run traffic like Jason mentioned unless you have your product and your pricing and your offers and your branding and all that stuff really dialed in and have complete clarity on and you've thought yep. through. And so for us, I guess really, if we're going to apply our own medicine is <laughs> we start, we start with uh, goals. Like what are our initial yep. sort of goals that we have for this new brand, this new Shopify store, and then start to translate that into the next phase, which is the branding and getting a cohesive brand built and, and done together yep. and yep. functioning yep. and sort of viable and, and then begin to move into the product strategy and where we end up. Yeah. That. So, all right, cool. Yeah, Fair enough. What, 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 let's talk about the goals and, and then uh, let's see how far we can get today a little bit. I don't know how long we can go, but we'll talk about goals. I think we could also talk about product strategy, which is top of mind for people, but we could also for sure. let's see if we can get through the first three real quick. So what are your goals with this whole shenanigan? I think goal number one for me is really sort of uh, figuring out how we leverage what we currently have. Yeah. And what I mean by that is so there was already some momentum, some established uh, social media platform audiences out there. And what is the most effective way to start to generate revenue with what we currently have while we're working on our product strategy. Okay. Yeah. If you have an audience, you can yeah. monetize that audience. What's the path forward for that? So to me, that's kind of like the goal. Cause I mean, obviously there are fixed expenses with, with buying this and, you know, recouping yeah. back um, our investment into it, paying for ongoing expenses. How do we most, the most efficiently and fastest way monetize that in order right. to cover costs and recoup what we put into it? as we're working on the brand and the product. So that'd be my, that'd be my first goal is like, what do we have to work with right now? And how do we leverage what we currently have to make money to cover costs and, and really give us really operational expense and to, to fund what we want to do in the future. Right. Because sure. ideally my goal with this is that it's a self liquidating um, component of our business. Like we don't have to dump a ton of additional money in, to make this thing grow. Let's figure out ways we can leverage what we have to sort of grow our product strategy to grow our audience growth, so. And by leverage what we have, you mean the Instagram account and the social all, media accounts that actually things. have some traction. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, cool, yeah. I, I mean, I think for me, the goals are, uh, a, cu a couple come to mind. Obviously, it's fun to sort something out and just say, can we make something out of this, you know, can, can we make it revenue positive? And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, it's, it's already got some assets, you know, as it, well, it's like the Instagram account in particular, but then the question is, can we turn this into a money-making venture? I mean, if we didn't want to make money out of this, we wouldn't be doing it. So, right. you know, I mean, so that's exactly. step one is cash. Right. Let's make money. Right. Um, so yay for, yay for that. So th there's no ul ulterior motive and, uh, you know, so how, how we make money out of this, I guess, will be something to talk through. But um, that's the first thing. The second thing, obviously, is I think this gives us an opportunity to teach an opportunity to share what we know about e-commerce. Um, so that's important. I also think it's an opportunity for me because my Instagram power work and the books that, that has come out, it's an opportunity for me to be sort of, you know, a manager of a larger Instagram account. This is the largest account uh, we, I'll have in our portfolio to manage. And so that's fun. I mean, it's just, you know, it gives us new opportunities. Um, it creates basically an opportunity for us to do things at a bigger, different level than we could through my own Instagram account, or even the ones that we currently manage for our current businesses. 
yeah, th- sure. this is a rock star status uh, level account. Um, and uh, so, you know, it's at 162,000 followers right now. Can we get it, you know, where, where could we take it? Can we get it to 200,000? You know, could yeah. we get it to whatever? So, sure. um, yeah. So, I mean, I think the goals are in that way, pretty straightforward. Um, uh, we want to, we want to turn this around. We want to, and then, you know, whether we hold it for a long term as an asset or whether we flip it, we don't know yet. Um, you know, maybe it's a uh, highly sellable if we sort it all out and we get a product strategy working. Um, sure. yeah. So those are goals. Um, definitely anything else on the goals and then we can talk about branding a little bit. Uh, do we want to set out sort of an initial revenue goal? Like how much money do we want to make? I mean, that's kind of, I guess, top of mind. Let's be real. Like, okay, so how much do we want to try to hit for like in the next month, two months? Okay. What's your goal? I'm, I'm, that makes me too nervous to have a real actual revenue. I know. Right. But like if if we, if we don't actually set one, like how are we, I mean, ideally, yeah. If we could make, honestly, I mean, I kind of just want to get to like what, like initially when you're, when you launch any store or anything like that, it's like, well, can we get to it like a thousand dollars a month? Yeah. Okay. That's, that's, that's pretty doable. And, and right. even if, even if the product right now is uh, as, as a media sale like if we're doing influencer sort of strategy or influencer deals sure. for other things can we bring in a thousand or even more per month just using okay. existing assets and social media without having a physical product or a course or information product strategy figured out the product yeah. is our media audience and so okay, how well, do you that immediately? all right okay yeah. we're, we're jumping okay. ahead we'll we're talk ahead. about product we'll, we'll um, get there we'll get there yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to do this if I didn't think it could be a six or seven figure business. I agree. Honestly. So, I mean, I, to me, that, I'm not sure that's a short term goal. It's probably a long term goal. Short term goal to me would be all execution strategies. Sorry, the sun is like something's happening here in Seattle. I don't know what it is. The sun um, is out. So you're you're being blinded. Um, yeah. So for me that, you know, the six or seven figure um, opportunity, if I didn't think it was that I wouldn't be interested in this. You know, so the other thing, so, so that I would say long-term revenue goal that I wouldn't be happy with this if it wasn't a six figure business at least and growing, you know? So, yeah. So I, I'm not sure about short-term milestone. Um, but yeah, no, those, those are valid questions. Those are great questions. So those are, yeah. well, I mean, I'm like, in my mind, yeah. I'm like, how do you, what's it going to cost us to run this thing out of the gate? And can we cover yeah. that cost immediately? And I figure if we get right. around a, a grand a month, we're we're in we're in the black for sure um so that's that's kind of a yeah. short-term short-term goal like in the next 30 days yeah. drink generate a thousand dollars in revenue yeah i would be i i would be happy with those okay results. all right i'll hold you accountable to that if you don't right. have a thousand dollars a month generated through this i'm just joking i know right, all right no, good. We're, okay good we're, right. Putting, we're putting it out there so everyone else Let's can do also it. Be accountable right like next time we do we do this show yeah for uh, this particular special edition, we got to report on it. Right. We got we to put it out there. All right. Totally cool. All right. Okay. Cool. So the next thing is uh, branding. You know, I mean, uh, obviously, as we mentioned, when we looked at the sites, there's three or four different brand names. Uh, and so we, we've already sort of sorted that out a little bit. And um, I think we've come to a good conclusion. And that's that basically the anchor asset is the happy gardening life. Mm -hmm. Uh, Instagram account. And as it happens, that domain name was available, Uh, the happy gardening life and happy gardening life. So we purchased those and it makes a lot of sense to just simply use those as the name. Yeah. Uh, So everything will change, uh, you know, this week or so to the happy gardening life. Um, The hashtag associated with that that's been used uh, since the account started was, um, it's got something like 240,000, uh, you know, photos associated with it. I mean, it's been used widely. It's basically installed in the gardening category as a commonly used top hashtag. And so you don't want to walk away from something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, we brainstormed, oh, we do, do we do something from scratch? We come up with a completely different name. And then we were like, well, I mean, why wouldn't we just use what it's sort of the one thing it's sort of galvanized 
energy around is the happy gardening life. And it's not too bad. It's long as a brand name, but, um, you know, it, it, it has, once you say it a few times and you remember it, the happy gardening life, um, it, it kind of has a few elements that are nice um, and it's workable. So uh, to me, that was sort of the no brainer choice. I mean, the more we talked about it, the more that became the obvious thing to do. Um, and so I think that makes a ton of sense. So the happy gardening life.com um, is going to be the site and all the other social channels will be renamed much as they can be renamed, you know, we'll work through that and have them rally around that brand idea. Um, so we're going to do a logo and we'll start to sort out those elements. Um, yeah. Any thoughts on the branding? What were your initial thoughts? We, cause we did brainstorm doing completely different things, but we did, we did, I, you know, with branding, it's one of those things where like, especially if you're starting and you're like, we can do, we can go wherever your mind starts to, go thinking in a bunch of different directions. And that's right. kind of where we yeah. were at with the brainstorming process. And you're like, well, what if we do right. this? What if we do this? And how about this? And what about this? And, and then it really, it did come back down directly to where do, where do we have the most current leverage in this business in terms of yeah. stuff that we have momentum in. And one yeah. of like, one of the core philosophies that, you know, we both try to implement on is double down on where you already have momentum and leverage. Like if you yep. already have movement in a certain yep. thing, you should push into that thing. And that just made sense because Instagram was definitely where we had that. And with the hashtag and all that, it just made the most sense when you step back from it. Yeah. Love it. No, cool. I mean, I, I, and I, I agree. I think we both settled on that pretty quickly, which is like, okay, that's what we should, we should just settle on that. And the domains were available and, you know, we've got some thoughts and ideas we'll share in the coming months related to that. But, I, you know, in short order, we'll have a brand new logo that'll make it look super legit and uh, go from there. So um, so that brings us to the third uh, chunk in our flywheel, which right. is product strategy. Right. Yep. Um, and so obviously this is sort of the most pressing issue. Um, how do we actually make it make money? And this is a topic that a lot of people struggle with. Obviously, a lot of people who are new to online sell sales, they want to figure out how to make money online. And maybe they're starting from complete scratch. They don't have something like we've just purchased, which has sort of some elements of it that have energy. I mean, you know, basically, we, we bought into a few components that have energy, but the sort of the heart of the animal is missing right now, right. which is product. And yeah. so, um, so that's what we need to think through. And so, uh, let's dive into that a little bit. You want to share some thoughts and ideas and talk about that here? I think we have time. Let's do yeah. it. Okay. So sure. yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say like, we bought in, we have this, you know, decent size Instagram account, but Instagram accounts by themselves don't make you any money unless you attach some level of product strategy to it and monetization. Yeah strategy so yeah that, that's pretty much it like you have this asset but now yeah. how do we leverage it to actually generate cash yeah all right so here's what and, and this is uh, something we we teach on and that kind of thing so we're going to just break down product strategy 101 and walk through this a little bit and hopefully this is educational and helpful for people who are struggling with what to do to find a product opportunity um and so so let's walk through that. So I'm just going to just start listing the styles of products that are available to us from left to right here on the screen, and we'll kind of categorize them and then we'll talk about them. So the first uh, product opportunity that's available to us is obviously handmade items, right? I mean, we could literally hand make something. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that is a method of product. Now in the gardening space, I have no idea what that would be. So we won't worry about it, but we're just talking about categories right now. That's true. Okay, so That's first true. thing is category handmade. And then the second category would be something we personally manufacture where, you know, you start, start making something in your garage. Again, I have no idea what that would be in the gardening space, but you know, you could see in general, that would be an opportunity. And then yeah. you have third party manufacturer. Um, and this is commonly made in China, right? Your item made in China, right? Um, so that's the third category. Are you, is this cool? Am I going too fast? Are you with me? 
keep keep rocking and rolling. Okay. So then there's um, other people's uh, manufactured items, right? And I, you could break it down and say other people's handmade, other people's personally manufactured, but let's not do that. Let's just say right. other people's, sorry, if I could spell properly, other people's um, manufactured items is another category. And this is of course, where you get into Alibaba, AliExpress, all kinds of ASD, go to a trade show, and et cetera, et cetera. And then the next category over would be private label, which is a version of other people's manufactured items. Sure, sure. So private label opportunities where it's made by somebody else and they put your brand concept on it. Correct. And um, so let's, we'll keep going here and then we'll talk about the pros and cons of all these. Mm -hmm. So what I would do here, unless, unless you think of other common things, is I would literally draw a line right here. And then on the other side of that line, I would say, I would say basically these are all physical items, mm -hmm. right? That's what we're talking about here from left to right. This is all physical item stuff, right? The opportunities. Yep. And in the realm of atoms, <laughs> there are various degrees of quality uh, of ideas, right? And um, you know, making things that have physical demands, there's pros and cons. So we'll talk about the pros and cons, but there's a whole different category over here, which of course you might have figured out where I'm going with this. And that is digital items, um, if I can spell. And so let's, so let's break it down further and say, okay, well, what are the, what are, what are the possible digital items that could be, could be done? And uh, if I can get my pointer to work here, um, you know, obviously what like Cinnamon and I's whole business is built on basically selling what you might call utility PDFs or useful mm -hmm. educational PDF documents, PDFs. Um, you could also put in that category eBooks, which is what in essence what we sell. We just don't do them on Kindle. Uh, we do them on our own website, but you, you could say something along the lines of useful content shared as a PDF document or other ebook. It's first thing, right? Um, so then you go over from there and you might say you could sell software. Software as a service, have some kind of software educational business, that kind of thing. And then you could say you could sell education. I'm going to run out of space on my screen here, but let's just call it education. Um, these are guru products, how to webinars, info products, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you, what you could also say beyond that is, um, you might just call it advertising, mm -hmm. advertising. And so I've run out of space on my screen, but tell me if I've missed anything that's top of mind for you. Anything here that membership sites, I suppose. Yeah, membership sites. So there's like a monthly recurring piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go underneath the education component for sure. Okay. And okay. Where would you stick like affiliate sort of sales with PDF? So there's your version of it where you own the PDF. It's your deal. It's your software. It's your educational component. Maybe yeah. under advertising, you would also do affiliates for those other digital items. Yeah, aff affiliate marketing is. Um, so there's two, there's two sides to that market. One side of that market is, um, you're selling advertising space. Think of it as like who owns the billboard and who pays to have something on the billboard. So if you own the billboard, then, um, you're selling advertising slots. Mm -hmm. Think of it that way. Yep. If you, if you don't own the billboard, but you own traffic then, and you know, so then there's a, the other side of it then you're like an affiliate marketer. Mm -hmm. So those, I mean, it's like, the, it depends on how you approach the topic as to whether, you know, who you are in the equation. Sure. Um, affiliate marketers send traffic to a product, right? But if you're the product owner and you want affiliates to promote for you, then you're just right. on the other side of the equation. Okay. So that I would put all that under advertising. Cool. Yeah. 
And I would also put under advertising um, influencer marketing. Right. You know, I mean, so, so influencer deals would, would fall into that. So I don't know if my screen, can you see my whole screen still? Yeah. Um, okay. All right. So, so I think we could, I mean, we, I guess we could unpack that a little bit and say, you know, influencer mm -hmm. deals, which um, are sort of, sort of novel, new, unique and new. Um, and so, so these are, let's just put it all out here uh, like this. Um, there's a lot of options. There are know? a lot. Yeah. Right. right. And, uh, so, so, and obviously we all know this, there's, there's a lot of options, um, that we, we could include. Uh, obviously one thing we left out here was, well, I suppose we didn't, but I was going to say arbitrage. Where does arbitrage fit in? Arbitrage fits in, in my view, under third party manufactured items. Yeah. Right. Like a drop it's, shipper. Like it's just not your item. Yeah. yeah. It, it's just other people or other people's manufactured items. I suppose other other people. Yeah. It'd be other, other, other people. It's like the okay. So this, model. yeah. So, so this is where you'd say this is uh, retail arbitrage would fall under this. Yeah. Um, uh, because that's a common model. A lot of people would wonder about where that fits. So that, that would fit there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, but you could also underneath that would be exclusives where you've got an exclusive deal with a manufacturer that would be the most optimal way to do other people's manufactured items. Uh, you could just do straight retail where you get yeah. wholesale pricing and you're a retailer for somebody who's the, you know, the original manufacturer. Yeah. So all of those well, fit underneath that. Yeah. I don't know where licensing deals would fall in underneath this, but that's also an interesting thing because technically in a licensing deal, you are actually the manufacturer, but you're paying a percentage to the brand. For example, if it's like Reebok or something, you're manufacturing it, you're selling it, but you pay for a licensing deal to have their brand stuck on it. So uh, the, in the two sides of the part of the party, two party agreement on that deal, I would put if you're paying to have a licensed use, like let's say you pay to have the Avengers, uh, you know, uh, trademarks and stuff used and you're making an item with it, then you're still in third party manufacturing mode over here on yeah. the left because you're making That's a physical true. item. Now, yeah. if you have the trademark and the intellectual property and you're selling it, then it's a digital item. Sure, sure. Basically, right? So it would fall on this side, the digital item side of the equation. Yeah. Okay, it's interesting. So, you know, the first thing that you want to do here is you're thinking about all these opportunities as pros and cons, right? I mean, that's the first question is what, what are the pros and cons of all of these options? Um, and that's really as soon as we got the opportunity related to uh, the, the new little company we bought, the Shopify site and the social accounts, that was the first thing we started talking about was what are the pros and cons of these various options, right? Yeah. And so, and, and how do we quickly monetize? And so, you know, we can just go through this. I won't type them all out, but let's just rattle off pros and cons of each one of these real quick. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll, we'll, we'll take turns. I'll go first. Handmade okay. items, pros and cons. The pros are they're unique. And generally speaking, then there's no one else in the world that's going to make something exactly like you did. Yeah. The cons are it's not scalable. Right. Now, if you're Pablo Picasso and you can get thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars for your unique handmade items, whether it's, sure. you know, a painting or whatever, then of course you're awesome. Yeah. But if you're crocheting a doily for the kitchen table and you sell it on Etsy, then of course that's not very unique. Um, yeah. And so, and it's not scalable either way. So that's the hard part, pros and cons of handmade. Um, if you personally try to scale up manufacturing of items like in your garage, what are the pros and cons in your mind? Uh, it's still not scalable. Uh, you might be incrementally more scalable, but that's not really going to be the scale that's going to make you money. The other thing that's attached to that, if you're personally manufacturing, and it's also tied into handmade side, is that you basically just, you have a job. Right. You know, if you stop manufacturing or making that thing, you go on vacation, you stop making money. Yeah. And the other side of that, that that's a challenge is that there's sort of the operational, um, you're making the product, but if you're making the product, 
you can't be selling the product. You cannot literally do both well at the same time. So that's another yeah. issue in the scaling side of it is that you're either going to be doing one or the other, and yeah. you're probably not going to do either at at uh, at a level that's going to get you to where you wanted to go yeah. as a strategy. Yeah. Okay, so if you go to China or wherever and have third-party manufacturing occur for your creation, your sure. unique unique creation, right. the pros and cons include the pros are you have uh, effectively bolted on manufacturing to your own, you know, kind of creation. So then therefore you can free yourself up to focus on other things. Right. Uh, so that's super cool. The yep. cons include, of course, the challenge of just knowing how to get it done. I mean, there's intellectual capital <laughs> required to think through yeah. how do you get that stuff to be done? A lot of people take trips to China um and there's tons of back and forth you have to have samples made uh the other challenge includes cost right so yep. the process of having tooling done or unique um you know work done in support of your idea so it is manufacturable is uh, frequently really expensive and then of course there's yep. what's called the minimum order quantity mm -hmm. where you've got to pay sort of a minimum or, or purchase sort of a minimum from the manufacturer yeah. He's going to make it for you. And uh, in that model, of course, the more you have manufactured, the cheaper they get. And so the challenge is if you don't have a product that's ever been tested in the real world of salesmanship <laughs> and yes. you don't know whether it's actually going to sell, then you're tempted to go big. And there's just nightmare so stories after nightmare stories of people who thought they were going to sell a truckload or a boatload of some special little widget they had made. And then as it turns out, they had a harder time selling it than they thought. And yeah. uh, those stories are legendary. Of course, that's the challenge. So that's pros and cons of third party. What about uh, retail arbitrage, wholesale work, all that kind of stuff, pros and cons? Absolutely. Uh, retail arbitrage, the cost getting into that is much cheaper than if you're going to go okay. and manufacture yourself. You can test things with it. So it's pros. Um, yeah. It still can require, depending on how you have it done, it's still a lot of, of your work involved. There's not a lot, still a lot of scalability unless you're hiring people. Um, yep. But even, but drop shipping, yeah, one of the, the disadvantage yeah. or the pros of that is that it's fairly cost effective to get into. There's not a huge bar uh, barrier of entry. Yep. Now the con of that, flip side is that everyone can do it and everyone tries so you there's a lot of competition uh, unless you have some sort of exclusive deal with that the other thing is you don't own the supply chain so your supplier can go out of uh, stock and then you're stuck sort of selling a product that you can't have access yeah. to and so then there's that kind of component of it um, yeah so th that's kind of like where the cons are is you don't have direct control over the entire supply chain which yep. is which is a challenge if you're trying to scale because you are then sharing that inventory with however many other wholesalers, drop shippers, and people that are out there. So right. that does that does pose a challenge. Um, the other thing too is that they could just decide to stop working with you. Like, what if yeah. what if the, the the manufacturer just says, "Hey, you know, this has been cool. You helped us really, you know, drive sales, but we're going to take this all in house and we're going to blow it up ourselves. We don't need you any longer, and you're done." Or what if they say, hey, guys, we can't sell the anymore because Amazon's buying all of our inventory now and selling it directly. That, that <laughs> happens. That happens. Like, we're just going to yeah. go straight there. So, you know, there's bigger fish out in the, in the ponds, you know, that you're swimming yeah. in. And you, that might be, be the case. So well, yeah. one other quick thought, though, back to the handmade manufacturer, personal stuff. That doesn't mean you can't prototype your product at that stage for sure. Like if you're in there and you want to build oh, something and you, you kind of figure it out and you're in that place where you're kind of figuring out the product and you're personally manufacturing, that's a good prototyping and you may need to do that, but you can't live there and really make a business there. So that's when you start moving up the food chain for sure. Yeah. Okay, cool. So then pros and cons of private label include you end up with a brand that you could have value in. I mean, if you, if you do it right, the brand is what is valuable. The, yep. um, and that's super cool. The down, and obviously that's an opportunity to create a Shopify site. Mm -hmm. So, you know, selling on your own website creates a whole set of cascading values. You've got traffic, you've got people signing up for your newsletter, uh, you're pixeling people. So on and on and on. 
and um, you can launch multiple products and get bigger and bigger as you go. So private label definitely gives you some benefits. The downside, of course, is if you try to sell that stuff on Amazon, for example, you'll quickly see in your category 30 other people selling basically the exact same widget um, just under a different name. And to an Amazon customer, that looks basically like you're, you know, just an also ran. Um, there's a very hard to, uh, to distinguish yourself in that situation with private label products on a big marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the downside of private label. Um, okay, good, good, good. Let's keep going. So now, now we transcend into cyberspace. We get yes. out of the world of atoms and physical items and the drama of things like shipping and we're into the realm of digital items so pros and cons of pdfs and ebooks uh margin that you can create much more of the the actual cost of goods yeah. on a pdf is the amount that of time it takes you to create it and that's about it like once it's built yeah. it can just it consistently puts out uh, cash when people buy it. Like you're not, you're not having to build a PDF from scratch every single time to deliver it to a, a customer. I don't have to right. order 5,000 PDFs to then send to a customer. You put it in one time and it just, it's like cloning. It just keeps on going out there. And that, that's a yeah. beautiful piece of it. The economists call that near zero marginal cost. And that is a yes. magical thing. Yeah. Okay, that cool. And that, the that's downsides. Downside yeah, is that you still have to, you have to create something because it's easy to create. Anybody can go out there and create a PDF or an ebook on any topic in the world. Like right. yeah. th there's, there's not really a huge barrier of entry to that either. So yeah. the downside is, is that it's ubiquitous information. You can, you know, you're probably watching this on YouTube. Um, anybody can go for free on YouTube and get information. So yeah. you have to have a unique angle you have to have a unique value proposition, even with your PDF or your ebook. Yeah, that's right. I totally agree. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, okay, let's keep going. Uh, sorry. Oh, wait. Am I still sharing my screen? Still sharing as far as I can see. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, okay, cool. Software, uh, pros and cons. Obviously, software's um, the pros are same topic, near zero marginal cost. Replication is almost free. Yes. The downsides are it's complicated to make you know i mean yeah, uh, yeah. so and, and uh but the complication of making software is actually falling every year it gets simpler and simpler to have people right. make things the cost yeah. is going down but the quality that this is a quality game and yeah. so software is the the best software wins yeah not the first and so, you know, you might have a good idea and then you make a software and um, it's marginal or maybe it's just sort of the first version of some idea. And then Silicon Valley comes along and they spend a hundred million dollars and they make an awesome killer version and you lose yeah. and they win. Done. And uh, yeah. that's the downside of software. Yeah. And the other downside to software is it is, it is expensive, even though you're sure. like, it's yeah. getting cheaper. It's still yeah. expensive if you want to create good software, like unless you're sure. a developer, but even then it's your own time yep. and you have to value your own time. It, it's, yep. it's not cheap. Yep. 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 Okay. So education pros and cons, and we'll include in education again, info products. Sorry, sure. my spacing is messed up now, but info yeah. products, uh, membership programs. Um, what yeah. else? Uh, I mean, courses, courses, all of that stuff all kind of fall yeah. in there. It's, it's probably one of the best business models ever. I mean, let's just be, let's be realistic. Like let's once be real. you create, I mean, because it comes into the, the, the same zero, uh, zero yeah, net zero marginal, marginal cost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Zero zero marginal marginal thank you, thank you. Yeah. The technical term. Uh, it still well. kind of fits that boat. But yeah. it's at a different sort of value proposition than, say, a PDF yeah. or an ebook. Instead of selling yeah. a PDF or an ebook for two dollars or five dollars or ten dollars or even twenty-seven dollars, yeah. now when you start talking about an info product that has substantial weight, and again, it comes back to value proposition and unique selling, you know, value or the yeah. unique selling yeah. uh, proposition for it. 
you you still can now start selling info products and membership and courses for thousands of dollars or five to six hundred dollar value you know right. so it's all about that so you're kind of le- taking it up to another level but you still have whatever the amount it costs you invested in the initial creation of that course you're done in terms of building the product or creating the product yep. and then it's just about yep. your marketing and reselling and how how much can you take it to scale yep for that component of it so okay it's, sure yeah it, it's a good business model uh it is it is it is uh okay so and then we'll get into the pros and cons of uh, selling advertising and we'll tie that together with influencer because sure um you know i mean that's so it, it's sim- simplest to think about influencer marketing as yep that. Um, and the pros and cons are, uh, the pros are, it's still a digital item. It's still Mm -hmm. not physical. You still don't have to do shipping stuff like that. Um, so that's super cool. The cons are you have to have a platform. (laughs) You you have to, you have to have, uh, you know, an audience, you, you, you know, you can't, unless you're, you could be a nano influencer if you have a hundred people that follow you and they're all billionaires or they're all like NFL players. And you know, you're like the, you're like the Kung Fu master master who everybody wants to learn from or something. You got a hundred, but usually you, you would still have a huge following if you're that person. Um, Right. Right. So uh, you got to have the audience is the downside and audiences don't get built easily and they don't get built cheaply. Uh, Real audiences, you know, um, Okay, so so this is sort of a recap of, of the whole entire realm of possibilities. And so let's circle it back to our opportunity here with Home and Garden America renamed, right. renamed. Uh, you know, uh, right. you know, happy gardening life. Um, yeah. So in general, <laughs> so you know, we can share what Kyle and I's conversation have been so far. I think if if it's um, not obvious, we're probably going to dream up, come up with and think about opportunities in this realm of potential opportunity. And as it happens, this guy here, influencer, seems to be the simplest uh, monetization path for the account based on the size of the Instagram following. And so in the short term, influencer deals seem appropriate. And I think if we build a brand cohesively with all of the social channels tuned to the one name and all working together in a synergistic way uh, and a website that really, really represents super well, then influencer strategy might make a ton of sense. Mm -hmm. And then beyond that, I think the question is what digital items could possibly be sold? in that space and are there any and so i think it's our job to explore what digital items could be sold in that space and we come up with uh tests and we come up with a brainstorm and we come up with a product plan for the digital items that uh people could potentially buy and you know i mean it's not rocket science there are sites where digital items are already available to be sold um you know uh the you know, opportunity on ClickBank, for example, comes to mind. Sure. There are products available that are, in, you know, educational products, info products that we could start repping, basically. And, um, you know, is that an option? I think so. Um, we've already sort of poked around a little bit. Um, and so, you know, this is the, this is the way, the way in which our mind is thinking about these things. And the reason is pretty straightforward. Um, you know, all of the the all of the negatives over on the left hand side of this ledger uh, with physical items include um, challenges related to cost of goods versus you know what you can sell for. So net profit. Um, that this is a challenge. Um, shipping uh, is uh, speed. I mean, the, these challenges over here are substantial. And if you're going to start a business, the real first question in my mind is, is there any opportunity for a digital item um, that uh, could be done? And 
um, you know, so, th so that's the first question. The other thing that I always like to talk about, which I'll draw a little doodle for is, Kyle can tell where I'm going with this probably. We want to make something out of this. Kyle, can you see where I'm going with this? I do. Um, um, we want to make something which is, you might call in Warren Buffett parlance, the castle with an unbreachable moat. And so the idea of this is, is there some way in which we can come up with a shenanigan that allows us to be what you might call de facto bulletproof yeah. from competition? And, um, and I'll just tell you, based on experience, because I've been in the digital selling business now for 10 years, the opportunity to be bulletproof in the digital sphere is incredibly more realistic than in the physical sphere in the physical item sphere basically people can always knock you off yeah basically yeah for sure you know that nobody can stop that mm -hmm. but there are strategies that you can use in the digital side of things to create so that's that's kind of where our mind is going with this is, can we do that? And so I, sorry, hopefully I'm still here with you. Yeah, you um, are. I'll be back. Yeah, so, so basically that. what we want to do is say, hey, this castle within a breachable moat thing, that's over on the digital side more easily yeah. than on the, uh, and then on the physical side, you know, and this little guy, this here, this castle with an unbreachable moat, this is what we're going for. Yep. Because if you can't make something that's sustainable for the long term, you don't really have a long term opportunity. You have short term opportunity. And that's not of interest to anybody, really. It shouldn't be. I mean, you know, uh, we want something that really will stand the test of time. And so that concept is is key. So hopefully I know we've gone on now for what? what we been? We're on our third hour, or fourth hour. It feels like it feels <laughs> like it. it's a marathon, <laughs> a marathon. But we've only talked about goals, brand and product strategy, but hopefully this has shed light on our thinking as it relates to this new opportunity. And um, the, in particular, the product approaches that we're going to take. And so, you know, I, hopefully this has been helpful and it is, is helpful to everyone who's watching to just sort out and think through what um, possible spectrum of opportunities exist that you can start to look into. And, you know, there's a million ways to make money on the internet. And that's the awesome part is, you know, there really are a, a million different ways to do it. And so for a lot of people that are trying to figure this out, and I was in that situation for 10 full years, from 1998 to 2008, I wanted to have an online business and I didn't know what to do. I just, I had no product strategy. And this scheme that we just put out on in the whiteboard that we just shared with you is really the culmination of 20 years of poking around thinking about it, and then really 10 years of execution on a business model that we've grown and grown and do have what we would consider a castle with an unbreachable moat around. And we've tried it all, man. I mean, pretty much everything in that, well, I, I shouldn't say that. We have not tried it all. We've tried quite a bit um, on that spectrum. And so hopefully this has been helpful. And all I can say is what you want to do is Find an opportunity in your space that you can sort out, find some margin around and really start to think through how do you go from a good business to a better business to a great business and a good product or good enough or even a bad product to a reasonable product to a good product to a great product. Um, and getting on that, that journey, that path is critical. Um, any final thoughts before we wrap up? No, I agree. And then I, I think once you have sort of the brand, which is in essence part of the unbreachable moat that you're creating around. That's right. Yeah. Um, through that, it, it gives you the ability, if you so choose, to do a lot more things. But if right. you're trying to like, I'm going to build my brand on a physical product strategy that doesn't have a lot of margin. And um, putting out a lot of capital to, to launch it. It's just, it's a much harder mountain to climb. Right. And so what we're ad advocating is you sort of begin to flip the script 
to think a little bit more contrary. And if you're coming from a physical product background or physical product, that's what you're, that's what you're doing to begin to tack on or even push harder into the yeah. digital space to sort of facilitate your brand growth that will only right. make your physical products business even better and scale faster than what you would have been able to done without doing it. Yeah. Well, one way to say it is the brand is your first digital asset or digital item right. that you create. Right. Yeah. That's what for it sure. is. For so sure. that's yeah, the sure. way to look at it. Yeah. And, yeah. and as Warren Buffett talks about when he talks about the castle with an unbreachable moat, he basically says for his examples, the brand is the way to do that or near monopolistic opportunities, which are rare. But yeah. um, but the brand is how people get that castle with an unbreachable moat. And, um, you know, so that's something to think about. OK, so uh, we owe everybody our next update. Let's say um, well, I thought what we'll do is maybe do the updates the, like the first week of the month or like the first 10 days so that we can do like a P&L and look at outcomes and actually share. Hey, here's right. what's happened. Here's how this is working. Exactly. Um, if we're, we're going to do the full Pat Flynn, uh, yeah. that's what we would do. And uh, so that's cool. I, I dig it. And so probably the next time we do this, we'll have quite a bit of momentum and energy around some of these short-term goals we've mentioned. Um, yeah. And it'll be fun to show people. Yeah. yeah. So we'll probably, we're thinking some sort of like beginning first week of April, I like guess it's the month yeah. of March to really sort of, well, yeah. we'll probably need another week or so to sort of finalize all the stuff we're working on, get, getting the transfer done, kind of sorting out branding and some of the stuff. And then we, we'll hit the ground running March 1st with our, uh, monetization plan and yeah. tell you what happens uh in yeah so. yeah no doubt cool man great time uh okay so if you've enjoyed this video and you're watching it uh anywhere youtube or facebook or wherever it might end up if it ends up on udemy then uh, leave us a comment let us know if you have questions yeah. we're happy to answer and uh we'll be sure to uh, respond as quickly as we can and uh we're really really excited to use this as an opportunity really to teach and um, and share ideas and insights so that you guys can be successful with your online selling ventures. That's the whole goal yeah. of it is to see you find ways to move forward successfully with your brand and your product ideas. Cool. Awesome, man. Cool. Good times. All right. Yep. yep. See you guys later. Later.